Well, uh, we're going to start talking about The Great Gatsby pretty soon. And one of the key things that we're going to do in this unit is talk about literary lenses. So I wanted to take a minute to do a couple things in this video. One of them is just remind you about the drive um, and uh, remembering that we, we do go to Honors English 3 folder, which you should already have a folder inside of, right? Um, and remember I kind of put in these unit folders for us. Uh, and so going to the Great Gatsby folder is going to be important um, for this unit because this is this presentation is inside of here. I'll put it in some other places as well. Um, but it's going to be a good resource for you to come back to again and again. And not just the video, but certainly the presentation itself. So a uh, couple things as we get into literary lenses. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do with them, what they are um, as a reminder, and how we're going to use them inside of our paper, um, all kind of sprinkled in uh, with trying to talk a little, as little about Gatsby as possible. Um, however, I do want to also talk about how we're going to talk about Gatsby because it's been something I've been thinking about uh, quite a bit as we've been making our way through the book. Or, I'm sorry, through the break. Ugh. Um, so, first things first, uh, literary lenses. If you recall from poetry, literary lenses are different ways to encounter a piece of literature. And they're, they're schools of thought. Um, there are probably a whole bunch more that I'm not even aware of. Um, in fact, there, there are a whole bunch just in general. Um, they're not always used for literature. We can use these in, in other walks of life. Um, if you think about a lens as a way to look at things a little differently, think about like uh, how if you become a diversity director for a corporation, you're looking through the lens of diversity and, and trying to understand, well, how will diversity benefit this company? And, and then all the way down to how will diversity benefit this group, right? So you're using that lens to inform your decision making. That's a, that's a really common practice that people use um, in all sorts of fields. But with literature, we're going to use this to do analysis. So uh, we've talked about this one before. It's called formalism. And uh, formalism is really important because it's one of the ones that you have actually just been messing with for a very long time. So that huge list of literary terms that you learn or relearn or kind of learn some new ones every year, they all kind of go to what formalism is. And uh, essentially, formalism is how the text is artfully expressed. So we're going to notice in a book like Gatsby that uh, the first chapter is really artful. Uh, it's almost like a giant poem sometimes um, in the richness of the language and the metaphors that are going on and the symbolism that's taking place. Um, and so formalist theory says, like, the book is not just what it's about. It's not about the plot. It's how it's written and it's how it connects to us on that metaphorical level, on that symbolic level. Um, and so we can really get that after chapter one, which you might have to read a couple times just to get a sense for how Fitzgerald is going to write this book. In fact, I, I always recommend that um, students read chapter one twice uh, just, just to kind of get the hang of how Fitzgerald uses language. Um, and then uh, as far as teaching this year, this, this COVID year, um, I'm actually going to do a conversation with a couple other teachers where we talk about formalism and highlight formalism, but we also talk about the content of the book. So you're going to get a good model from us of uh, here's how to talk about a book. Here's how to cite references inside of a text. Um, here's how to make these discussions kind of move on, you know, one is just kind of a what's going on in the book level. And two is what do you kind of need to know or understand using this lens level. So formalism, an important lens. Uh, you're also going to notice that in this presentation, it's rather important because I'm asking formalist questions for chapter one. So I'm not only introducing what the lenses are in this presentation, I'm also giving you some reading questions uh, to think about as you're moving through chapter one or as you 
as you're thinking about chapter one post reading. Uh, don't want to linger too much on that because I don't want to give away parts of the text. So the other thing that we're going to do with Gatsby is we're not just going to learn literary lenses. We're going to shift lenses every time we read. So you're going to use a different lens every time we read a new chapter. So chapter two is about Marxism. So what's Marxism? Well, uh, if you get a chance and you can go to the salon, uh, you're going to get a detailed understanding of what Marxism is. But essentially, Marxism is understanding that um, class is a part of uh, how we understand the world and therefore how we can understand a text, right? So when we think about social class, in America, we typically think about, you know, the 1%, the ultra wealthy, the Jeff Bezos uh, of, of it all um, as just having this massive kind of wealth that, that's almost unimaginable. And then we move down from there, right? We move to kind of the the... 1% underneath the 1% uh, that still has a huge amount of wealth um, and what they're able to do with their lives. Um, people making millions of dollars a year, maybe not billions, but millions. Um, and then we move down to um, middle class. Middle class is, you know, people, couples making less than $500,000 a year. You know, you can kind of figure out where the marks are, but it's all about money, right? Um, and we're definitely going to get a lot of that in Gatsby, but reading this as, you know, is there commentary on class? Does class become important inside of the text? And so you can see some of my questions here um, that you can ask about any book, right? Does class play an important role in the text? Um, I can't remember if you guys read Of Mice and Men, but you can ask this question of Of Mice and Men, right? You can ask this question of Bardo. Uh, remember, class actually kind of played a role in Bardo, right? So um, that's how we look at things from a Marxist lens. Queer theory we're going to use for chapter three, and queer theory is a particularly interesting theory. Um, one thing that we want to really understand about queer theory is we're not going to make any assumptions about sexuality. Um, so typically when we sit down and we, we feast on any kind of entertainment, um, we usually use the, the lens that we're most familiar with, which is white, usually male, usually heterosexual. Um, that is the typical lens of uh, specifically America. And what we do then is we sit down with material and we kind of assume that people are straight until they tell us or show us in some way that they aren't. And queer theory just says, don't make any assumptions. Just watch what people do. And that's going to tell us, uh, you know, are we being gender blind? Are we being uh, blind to people's sexual desires or characters' sexual desires? And that queer theory is about we shouldn't be blind to those things, right? So um, part of queer theory is, of course, about sexuality. Uh, are there men who are more interested in men or seem to have more uh, intimate interactions with men? Is there a chance for homosexuality? But also, are there men who have traits that are more feminine um, or vice versa, right? So just thinking, oh, my Amazon track package is on the way. Um, just thinking about uh, observing and losing the obviousness. Um, queer theory can be a lot of fun. Uh, you can do things like, uh, if you guys read, I'm thinking you read Caesar last year. Um, but you have all these like very strong male characters talking about how much they love each other. And, you know, what happens to Caesar? He gets stabbed to death by a whole bunch of men who love him. Hmm. Interesting. If we take away our assumption that everybody is straight, uh, suddenly we have different kinds of symbols that are showing up and uh, different kinds of viewpoints that are showing up. And, you know, then if we add some history to it, that uh, ancient Rome was full of male-male relationships. In fact, that was kind of the way of the world. Um, then, man, we really have some stuff to play with, right? So um, we're not we're not putting anything onto characters. We're not saying that they're things that they aren't. But we're um, we're actually taking all of those things away with queer theory, which is a really really interesting way to look at text. We'll talk about queer theory a lot when we get to chapter three. Um, inside of that, that discussion. 
Uh, New historicism. So uh, this one should feel a little familiar. We've been doing this again, kind of without the label for a long time. We did this with the label, with our poetry. And um, guess what? Gatsby is nearly 100 years old right now. Um, It's going to be, I think it's 95 this year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, And so we have a really interesting opportunity to look at a book that is set in the 1920s. Uh, and does it apply today? Um, so looking at new historicism, it's a theory that says that literature should be interpreted and studied within the context of both its time and our time. Um, so is it something that really um, talks to us today? And I think we're going to get some interesting, especially with COVID, we're going to get some really interesting takes on this as to whether or not it still really applies today. And could the story work if it were just transported to today and takes place in in 2021? Um, Could the story work just as well? And uh, we can can ask some interesting criticisms from that. Okay. Uh, So reader's response. So um, I will say a couple things about reader's response. Um, You will not be allowed to write your paper using reader's response. Um, just because there's a, there's a really interesting way to write a reader's response paper. Uh, but it, it takes more of my time than I have. So you'll actually do that if you take AP Lit with Mr. Jennings next year, a really interesting paper using reader's response. Um, it's considered to be less academic than the other lenses because it is essentially how you feel about the text. Um, and you've probably heard the school of thought before. I think we hear a lot of it with poetry that, um, how you feel on a personal level is just as important as what the author wants is what we call authorial intent. Um, and that what you read into a book, like if you read into a book, something that the author didn't necessarily plant there, then it's still a valid interpretation. So you can kind of see why that's not necessarily as academic um, because we're relying on personal opinion as opposed to kind of proving it out. Um, But still a really, really valuable thing, right? Um, Certainly that, as I've stated here, like if you're a capital R reader, you're probably reading because you love reading and you're probably used to responding to a text and feeling like you've made a connection to the text, right? Uh, I'd say probably uh, just after reading your your um, literature narratives, a lot of you have had that experience. So uh, reader's response really validates that experience and says it's really important. Um, but it's also a way to do um, an actual analysis of it. Uh, we actually place this one right in the center of the book um, just so we can kind of have a break and then ask these questions like, how do we like the book so far? Uh, which which I think are really valuable questions. I, I certainly think um, that we, we want to read things that are engaging, not just things that are, uh, you know, interesting because somebody else said that they're interesting, right? Um, and usually we, we do as a group like Gatsby, although I can't claim that everybody likes Gatsby every year. Psychoanalysis. Uh, So psychoanalysis, we're actually going to use with yellow wallpaper as well. Um, So really kind of familiarize yourself with this one um, this week. If you don't even kind of look at the other ones, that's fine. Um, But we understand psychology as a science of understanding the human mind, right? And so what does that mean? It means that um, especially as we get into our teenage years and into our adult years, um, and, and I would I would say more adult years than teenage years, just because you know as teenagers you're you're not just controlled by your mind, but you're also controlled by all your hormones and all the things that are going crazy in your body. And adults, those things have lessened, right? I'm not going to say they're not there, but they've lessened. And um, we also probably have more experiences that psychology would say have sculpted our psyche a little bit. And you're still in what we call our formative years, right? Where those things are still sculpting you a little bit. So what motivates people? Well, a lot of psychology is going to say your past is what motivates you. Um, And... 
uh, you know, that's what gives you your depression and your anxiety, along with maybe, you know, actual medical conditions and things like that. Uh, psychology is, is basically a new science. I mean, it's, you know, 140, 160 years old right now. But as far as sciences are concerned, it's pretty new. Um, and so there's different layers of psychology that we use. Uh, literature really, really likes the founder of psychology, Sigmund Freud, um, because Freud's theories, they kind of set the basis for psychology, but then they're all like impossible to prove. Um, but they kind of make sense when you hear them. And um, they're definitely things that we can apply to characters, even if we can't apply them to people. Um, understanding that characters are, are you know, faux people, they're, they're kind of like ghosts in a way that they exist in a different plane than real people do. Um, so this lens uses the field of psychology to analyze the motivations of characters and what's, what baggage they have and what's going on inside of them. And we can do really fun things like, uh, you know, if we know what abnormal psychosis they might have, we can diagnose them with a, with a mental disorder or something like that. Um, this is kind of fun because in real psychology, you can't do that. You can't, uh, it would be unethical to, uh, diagnose somebody with a, with a disease, especially a mental illness when you've never met and talked to that person. Right. Um, so to, to say that, you know, a leader is crazy, um, we use that terminology kind of generally, but a psychologist shouldn't use that kind of terminology without having done some probing of somebody. And then they wouldn't say crazy. They would come up with whatever the, the disorder is, right? But it's perfectly ethical to do that with fictional characters, right? So we can have some fun by putting on top of, man, maybe this character is narcissistic, right? Well, what is narcissism? Mm, does this character show signs of narcissism? So we can kind of have some fun with that. Feminism is another lens that we're going to use with yellow wallpaper. So um, the, the two that we're going to use with yellow wallpaper and Gatsby are psychoanalysis and feminism. Um, regarded as how literature portrays um, the relationship between men and women, um, I, the, the definition here uh, portrays the male domination in regard to female bodies by exploring political, social, economic, psychological, and, ex and, and other forces. Um, so that can be a lot of different things. Uh, remember that pretty much everything ever written has happened before modern feminism. Um, even, even if we say, you know, the, the first wave of feminism, the segregationists, uh, not, <laughs> not the segregationists, <laughs> the suffragettes, I am sorry, uh, chalk that one up to, to me talking too much. Um, so when we think about the suffragettes, right, the first women who, who boycotted and, uh, and um, you know, spoke up to, to have voting rights in this country, if we think of that as the first wave of feminism, that had just happened when Fitzgerald wrote this book, right? So it's almost impossible for somebody pre-modern ideas about women to talk about women in a modern way, right? I'm not saying it's not possible because there certainly have been uh, empathetic men and female writers, surprise, surprise, uh, prior to, to the second wave of feminism in the 1960s. Um, but um, thinking about that dynamic uh, is usually going to get us to see male domination uh, in, in earlier works. Uh, and then in later works, we can kind of look at, oh, well, what is the portrayal of gender? How is gender portrayed? Um, kind of like queer theory. Do we see feminine, um, you know, traits inside of men? What does that mean? Why is the author doing that? Um, and then again, the, the relationship between men and women and are women being treated fairly? Are they being treated fairly according to their societal standards? Are they being treated fairly according to our societal standards? That's where we can use a lot of feminism inside of, of texts. Chapter eight is, uh, we're going to use post-colonialism and post-colonialism is kind of a tricky one. Um, especially when you're using uh, a book like Gatsby, which is essentially about all white characters in an all white world. 
Um, and so we're, we're going to twist and do some interesting things when we get to post-colonialism. But, but essentially post-colonialism is looking at the culture of the conqueror, of the conqueror and the culture of the conquered. So if we want to think about this, um, the, the best way to think about this in American culture is to think about Native American culture. They were colonialized, right? I mean, they were actually just wiped out. But they were colonialized in a lot of ways, just like African Americans, uh, you know, taken from Africa, right? They were colonized. They were taken over by Europe um, and disseminated to to lose their culture. Um, and so what we have is we have the conqueror, the dominant culture, and the dominant culture seeks to stamp out the the culture that um, the natural culture or the conquered culture. Uh, and so what do we get as a result of that? We get things like stereotypes. We get things like uh, lacks, a lack of characters with minority voices. Um, what happens when we do see the minority voices? Are they portrayed fairly? Um, and so that, that gets to be very, very layered, right? This is where we start talking about race. This is where we start talking about um, equity and some of these other things that are very popular to talk about now, but definitely were not popular to talk about for a very long time. Um, and so we'll look at that. You know, what does it mean that there are essentially no people of color inside of Gatsby? And then the few that we see, what does it mean and how they're portrayed, why they're portrayed that way? And uh, what does that say about the culture of the time? And what does it say about our culture as we read them? Chapter 9 Again, a familiar lens is old historicism. And so investigating the conditions of the book, uh, who is the author? What is his personal like? Um, you know, what was the time period like? What was the 20s like? Um, again, totally common for us to kind of do this background work. Um, Gatsby is a book that really opens up to old historicism because uh, we are very fascinated with the 1920s. If you don't know a lot about the 1920s, you're going to learn a lot about the culture of that time as we work through the book. And Gatsby, I mean, this is no spoiler, uh, Gatsby is typically seen as like the book that defines the 1920s, um, uh, especially in American culture. It's kind of known as that book. Uh, and so, uh, of course, old historicism is going to work for that. We get to ask questions like, you know, is S. Scott Fitzgerald Gatsby? Um, is his wife Daisy? Uh, you know, did they have marital problems? Uh, yeah, they totally did. They were cheating on each other for their entire marriage, even though by all accounts, they seem to have really loved each other a whole lot. Um, was there tragedy inside of their love? Yes, there was. Uh, so we have all of these kinds of things going on. And believe me, if you want to peel back the layers of who F. Scott Fitzgerald is, you're going to find some interesting things. Um, even the fact that Gatsby is clearly his favorite thing that he ever wrote. Um, and he kept a copy of Gatsby on him at all, almost all the time. You'll kind of hear me talk about that as we, as we get into the book. So, uh, understanding old historicism or looking at the book in the context of its time. Um, and you can write a really great paper on almost any of these lenses. Um, Okay, just kind of in general, tips for the, the paper. I'll show you the folder. Um, you know, when you are preparing, when your group is preparing to have a discussion with me, so what we'll do, we have eight groups. Uh, I'm modeling chapter one, and then chapters two through eight, each group will pick one chapter. You'll really prepare that chapter. You'll really prepare the lens, and we'll do a conference that I'll record uh, where we have a discussion. And our discussion, I mean, it'll probably run about 40 minutes. So it's kind of like the poetry discussion. Um, and then I would expect everyone is watching those discussions because we're not able to have a whole class discussion. Um, we'll, we'll work the discussions that way. Um, and then when we do see each other in class, we'll, we'll talk about the book and how far we are up to that point. Um, that's the way that I'm, that I'm thinking about doing this. So uh, you need to know where to get your hands on the information. Um, Bressler 
is the writer of the book that I'm going to use to talk about literary lenses. So I've given you kind of a few pages of that book on each lens. Um, and so you might want to read up on Bressler's definition of feminism and the types of questions that he might use before your group. But then if you're using feminism to write your paper, you're definitely including Bressler inside of your paper. We're going to talk about how to do good literary research. We should have access to SLU's databases. So we're going to be able to get some good literary research, kind of help us make a case for something. Um, and we're going to really, really, really get into MLA citation because this is the last paper before Diso Logoi where I'm going to be a huge pain about MLA citation. Um, looking at, uh, you know, my role a little differently, my role is to give you way more of a support role. Uh, it's your peer is giving you good feedback that's going to help you a lot more and, and move you to the next place of your writing. Um, and like I said, MLA is going to be important. So just, just kind of know this is going to be a little different paper as we move forward. We really didn't write the poetry essay, which would have helped us a little more for this essay. So I'm thinking we'll probably need a little bit more time or a little bit more uh, guidance from me than, than I'm used to giving just because of that lack of poetry essay. Um, Gatsby is a whole lot of fun, and we're going to get into some really cool stuff when we get to it. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to read this great, creepy story called The Yellow Wallpaper. Um, I really encourage you to read The Yellow Wallpaper um, not late at night. Uh, try to read it while, while it's still light outside, because uh, the end of it is super weird, and it might give you nightmares. Uh, definitely don't eat a lot of jalapeno peppers and then read it and then go to sleep because that will definitely give you nightmares. Um, all right, we're going to have some fun. I will see you guys in class.